What's up, guys? I'm Matt Reisinger. And I'm Travis Brungart. The build show today, Shade Pockets. Have you built some of these before? I've done them in the worst way. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of good info. We're talking about this right here, which is a pocket that your shade will fit into. We're in the rough stage. This is not the prettiest stage, but this is where all the details come in and you can see the pre-planning. Today's build show, Shade Pockets. Let's get going. Guys, if you don't know Travis Brungard, he's with Catalyst Built in Kansas City, Kansas. He is a master electrician and holds a mechanical license, and he's done shade pockets on his jobs before. We're talking about this box you're seeing up here, which is gonna be a spot to recess those shades or blinds, depending on what you call them. Travis, talk to me about what you need to do for pre-planning for these. Oh my gosh, so much. Uh, you gotta have the material selected, obviously, knowing what manufacturer the client or the architect is gonna specify. Yep. That's the starting point to know the size that you're gonna need, the shape of the box, how yeah. deep, all those things. Certainly planning for your power needs mm -hmm. because you're gonna wanna operate these electrically. Uh, and then any control wiring, all that. But for what you needed to worry about here, it was structure. That's right, it was trusses. So these are, as you can see, a trust uh, almost flat roof. And so we worked with Builders First Source to make sure that these shade pockets or blind pockets would fit in the truss design. But let me back up a second. You said something really vital, which I think is the hard part about these, is you really need to know all the details about that shade ahead of time. You can't just say, I want shade pockets. We as builders need to know the exact roller dimensions, the exact manufacturer dimensions because the power might come on the right, left, middle, who knows where, and the size of roller makes a difference too. So on this one, these are actually Lutron shades. Lutron has a great system. They're definitely a, on the upper price point scale, but boy, are they nice. Also, this client wanted a double roller system where we've got both a blackout shade and a light filtering shade. So for us, Travis, we knew kind of maximum pocket size right from the get-go and we we're able to give that information to the manufacturer now on power uh, are most shades in your mind low volt high volt do you have any idea all all the ones we've dealt with are low volt so that makes it an easy pull of you know bell wire works usually right. it's cat six is what we're running for that uh, and that makes it pretty simple because you've got your needs met there quick and easy but I mean, there's a lot of different options in the market, so you really do need to make that initial selection and stick to it. You gotta lock it in early or yeah. you can't get it right. That's a great point. Now for us, we actually purchased these through our low voltage contractor. So Bill Blaylock is doing the shades on this job. Sometimes you're gonna purchase those through a shade specific dealer. We actually have a great one here in Austin. But the real key here is before framing, before framing even is anywhere near starting, you need to know all those dimensions and you got to get that in your budget too, right? Because this is not an inexpensive proposition. No, it is not. And I can tell you from experience, you want to be on the front end of it because to retrofit these in is a nightmare. Yeah. It's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra cost. For sure. So Travis, in this case, uh, Emma, my project manager, got the finished carpenters out to build these boxes offsite and then bring them here to the job site and had the finished carpenter install those. What's your experience with that versus maybe someone trying to do these with rough framing and then drywall? <laughs> it's a nightmare to do it with drywall. I can tell you, we, we sat at the design table and worked through the iterations of it. And we're like, oh man, I'd really like to do these out of melamine, get them all looking good before they go up into the ceiling. Because as soon as the client hits the, hits the job site, they're looking around for imperfections always. Mm -hmm. And those things aren't gonna get a shade in them until the job is almost completely done and final cleaned, sometimes even after that. Yep. So anything that looks bad is a no go. And I'm like, ah, oh, we really, we'd really like to save some money having your trim carpenter out and building out of melamine versus why don't we just do drywall on the inside? I know that Lydia is amazing, but I have to tell you, I don't even think Lydia could have saved the workspace of trying to get a three-way corner in a four-inch box. Yeah, how do you get your hand up in that, inside that shade box to get a piece of uh, drywall tape in there, mud that correctly? So learn from Travis's mistake. Don't do the amount of drywall. And, and the key here ultimately is you got to budget correctly, right? Because a finished carpenter is a much higher rate per hour typically than a rough carpenter who might just build a rough box and assume we're going to get half inch or five eighths rock on there. And it's a, it's a separate trip. Your trim carpenter is not usually in the job at this stage unless he's set in pocket door or hardware or something like that. Yep. This is a, a trip charge and a build charge and you've got to coordinate the material being available for them. All those things require great planning. Emma knocked it out of the park here. Yeah, she did. A couple things I want to notice. 
Uh, look how complicated this corner is behind us, Travis, yeah. where we've got trusses, we've got an angle, a bunch of angle brackets, and really amazing pre-planning there. On the other hand, though, you will notice we made a mistake. We're not as perfect as, uh, as we'd like to think. Uh, you noticed this right away. What's going on with that plywood on those trusses right there? Well, as someone who has had to modify a truss in the past, I can tell that's the telltale plywood wrap. Uh, if you have to change, and it, it makes sense that this wouldn't have been part of the original plan. This is a door, this isn't a window. Yeah, yeah. So you go around and you look at your window schedule and you make all your pockets off that, yeah. it's a door. So we gotta add that in. If you're gonna have to cut a truss, you gotta talk to your engineer. That's right. The truss manufacturer has their own in-house engineering firm that deals with their repairs in the field. Get them to sign off and do it exactly the way they said, it's no problem. Yeah, I talked uh, to, well, I didn't talk to you. Our project manager, Emma, talked to BFS, uh, our, our main truss guy. They've got a truss repair detail that's pretty off the shelf detail. And when we've modified trusses, for the most part, if it's three quarter plywood on both sides and it's not a big enough cut uh, that it's gonna cause major structure, you're gonna wrap that in plywood. There's a glue and a nail pattern because they want you to really make sure that thing is, is, tr is truly rigid. carrying that load. So in the end, it wasn't horrible for us to modify this, but it was really easy to miss and not put a shade in front of a door. Oops, yeah. big mistake. So we were able to fix that one. But every other window really on the first floor has a shade pocket. Uh, and so this was a big budget item and a lot of pre-planning, but if you take the time to pre-plan for it and know what's happening, back to the original point which you made, which is no, you gotta even know your shade material, frankly, because a thinner material might roll up to a smaller ball, think about that. So this is a really big deal. The other thing you need to know way ahead of time is full length on that. You see that these pockets are at least two feet above our headers and they're dropping all the way down to the floor it's a really big deal. Can I add in that someone might make the mistake of going, oh, well, I'll just make it bigger. Well, you kind of defeat the purpose of the really sexy, clear That's line right. at the yeah. ceiling where everything's perfect if you have a big box with a little slider or a little roll in it. Yeah. It just doesn't work as well. So it's worth the commitment from the client early on right. or the designer to pick it and stick to it, and then you can make it exactly the way it ought to be. I agree, and the last thing I'll make uh, point-wise is Lutron, you get what you pay for. This is a really nice shade, but they also have an aluminum kind of valence that fits up in that pocket. So we're not worried about making that pocket perfect. Uh, and in fact, we primed these, but we really don't need to paint them, Travis. Unlike you'll notice our slot diffuser here that right. Jeff and his guys painted all black so that when that, that grill goes up, that'll look like a black hole. We didn't have to do that here, but if this was another manufacturer, you might either consider going black inside that pocket, or you're gonna have to really make sure that that finished plywood, maybe even a melamine, mm -hmm. looks really good inside that shade, because it's gonna depend what am I gonna see in there after the fact. Uh, and the last point I'll make on this particular job, which is actually still a little bit in the air, Emma and I are gonna do a mock-up of how that drywall dies into the plywood, because the plywood's coming down, and then the horizontal drywall, that's gonna be a 5 8 ceiling sheetrock. Yep. We're assuming we're probably gonna put a Trimtex J-bead on there, but we're actually gonna have the finished carpenters mock it up where we're gonna have them install an entire sheet of drywall, cut that out with that spiral bit, you know, the, what do they the call those? Drywall uh, router. Drywall router. Roto zip. Roto zip saw, that's what I meant to say. They're gonna roto zip that out and then slide that on and make sure that's gonna work. So we're gonna test that ahead of time to make sure that's the right bead. That's the way to go. Guys, if you're not following Travis, you should go follow him on Instagram, at Catalyst Built. And he's also shooting videos on his job site about his builds, his remodels. He's doing some really high performance stuff in Kansas. He's an amazing builder. We're so thankful to have him on Build Show Network. I'll put a link to all Travis's videos over on buildshownetwork.com. That being said, Travis, you know how we close these videos out, right? <laughs> follow us on TikTok or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show. Yeah.